Welcome to the B2B Category Creators Podcast, hosted by Gil Alouche, founder and CEO of Metadata.io. This podcast is all about sharing the real and sometimes edgy secrets of B2B software creation. On today's episode, we have James McDermott, CEO and co-founder at Lytics, and Mickey Alon, CTO and co-founder of Gainsight PX. Hello, everyone. Happy Friday. My name is Gil Alush. I'm the founder and CEO of Metadata.io. This is another episode of Category Creators. We have um, James from Lytics and Mickey from Gainsight. Maybe, James, you can get started and introduce yourself, uh, tell a little bit about your career and your history and what you do today. Sure. Yeah, I'm uh, James. I'm CEO and uh, co-founder at Lytics. Uh, we're a customer data platform. Started the company uh, in 2013, launched the product, first product in 2014. Before that, um, I actually was uh, running another startup uh, in the mobile software space, which was acquired eventually by um, a company called Sprinkler out in New York. Um, and then uh, before that, uh, I worked at a software company, WebTrends, here in Portland, Oregon, um, mm. and I ran at various times, uh, all of business development, corporate development. And there we, we acquired five companies. Um, and eventually that company was acquired by Oracle. Um, and then before that, uh, I was, I'll, I'll, I'll kind of fess up here. I was a lawyer. So um, I was uh, in corporate law, uh, working for a law firm in California, Brobeck, Flager and Harrison. And, um, and uh, yeah, that's about it. I think um, I've been up here in Oregon uh, doing startups for the last 15 years and uh, before that in the Bay Area. What a crazy transition. Uh, definitely going to ask you more about that soon, sure. but definitely OG in MarTech. Sounds like a lot of experiences in, in MarTech. Mickey, you're next. Tell us a little bit about yourself. I know you uh, from before, but for the, for the benefit of everyone else, your, your background, some of the companies you, you worked on and what you do today. Sure. So um, today I'm the CTO and co-founder of Gainsight PX, previously known as Uptrinsic, a recent startup. It's about product experience management. Uh, before that, I founded a company called Insight Era, which is about website per personalization. Uh, that company got acquired by Marketo. I joined Marketo for a couple of years, um, leading their global engineering team uh, until Marketo got acquired by Vista. Uh, recently, Vista also acquired Gainsight, so there's some some sort of sort of a pattern pattern actually happening here. Uh, but in the past, I would say ten years, mostly in startups, then through acquisitions, uh, and so uh, getting some experience both on early stage, but also in late stage public companies like Marketo, uh, reaching to six thousand customers, um, and then with Gainsight, we are hoping to replicate that success as well. So I've, I've seen both uh, challenges, which I kind of really led me to, to build the recent platform that I'm focusing on. Previously, you know, coming from engineering background, so I've done previous uh, uh, startups as well, being on the engineering side. During the recession uh, in 2008, it actually kicked me to take a more business type of position, uh, which was very, very interesting. We had to, in, the, in that uh, in that period, uh, it was part of uh, Gigaspaces. We were a very technological company and we had to cut down the company very dramatically because the major vertical for us was the financial sector. Mm -hmm. And when everything went down, uh, Lehman Brothers was, was, our, was our biggest customer. And uh, we had to basically decide to kind of turn the engineers into sales and, and do the business as well and work with the CTO and the CEO. But it really taught me a lot about the go-to-market, marketing, uh, sales, all that process, which for me was amazing. Um, and what helped me really build the, the, the companies I've uh, built after that. So that was really the twisting point in a, in a recession back then. From engineering to the dark side uh, during uh, the during economic crisis. We'll talk more about that. That's cool. Well, I'm very excited to have you both. Um, do you have your drinks? I'll uh, take a more moderate drink. <laughs> I do. I've got mine right here. Mickey, there's, there's no excuse. You have to drink with us. Unless you, unless you have whiskey in this coffee. It's, it's yeah, let's call it like a better Irish coffee. <laughs> okay, sounds good. Irish coffee works. I never drink red wine. I've only been drinking. Well, I do drink red wine, but I've been really in this like white wine phase. Is that right? 
heavy white wine. So anyway, I got some I got some red wine from you, and I'm gonna I'm gonna have a little taste right now. Let's see what we got. Cheers, man. Mm. Ah, tasty. Nice. Is it uh, what is it? What kind of red wine? It's a uh, Cabernet. Cabernet. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Pinot Noir is my personal. It's the, kind of the only wine I drink in general. Not and I don't drink white at all. It's uh, only Pinot. Pretty much. Man, I, I got probably like six months ago. I just got into white wine, and it's like <laughs> there's the French Chablis or the French Chardonnay. There's the you know obviously all the Italian whites. There's the so you got the French whites, the Italian whites, the California whites. Uh, been yeah, I'm, 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 I don't know what I just went deep into the white into the whites. Obviously, up in here, here in Oregon, Pinot Pinot Noir is like huge it's a big deal, right? Yeah, a big, big deal. So that's like kind of the, that's kind of the standard, you know, you, you, you go around and people will, and one of my friends, somebody we used to work with, actually, he runs a winery called Purple Hands. Okay. He owns a vineyard and the grapes are the ones that basically produce this, this Purple Hands wine. It's probably about, it's pretty expensive. It's about a hundred dollars a bottle, but delicious Pinot. If you want to get a great Pinot, that's the one. Purple hands sounds Purple good. Hands. Uh, yeah, sounds yeah. interesting. Yeah, <laughs> Beetlejuice. Uh, that, that's good. Let's start with something uh, something simple. This uh, podcast is in theory and sometimes in practice about category creation. It's for entrepreneurs like me who are newer to the game and want to create a category and do not want to repeat the mistakes of others. And, uh, and so we try to understand from, from practitioners who've done that successfully. What are the steps? What are the hidden truths? Uh, from your perspective, maybe uh, maybe Mickey can you can get started. Was there uh, is there a, a a tactic or a hack that you find to be something that you repeat in Insight Terra and in in uh, in Uptrinsic and maybe in other companies about creating a category, and getting that getting that focus? Yeah, absolutely. I think in 10 years to go through four M&As, it definitely has some pattern in it. So, so it's uh, it's a lot of luck, but also uh, placing a better bet, maybe. Um, I think it's, uh, I would call it category disruptors as opposed to creators. Uh, although Marketo did create or be, was part of creating a category, and back then uh, the space was uh, noisy, uh, because it had uh, at least 20 players. I remember the, the early days with Marketo, the, the VCs thought that the market is very, very noisy because it has 20 players. Now we have 9,000 players. Uh, but if you know that uh, the, the essential truth about customer acquisition or revenue acquisition and accelerating revenue has to be more scalable, and you know that everybody's just trying to do it you know, with a sales-led model, you know that that's gonna be, um, you know, a, a disrupting category. You're using technology to get a hundred x efficiency, and that's the category to be in. Um, the other element that I look at is the market. I don't control the market. Um, you know, creating a category is very, very expensive. Disrupting is less expensive uh, because there is a need, and you're coming with an alternative which is a hundred x or ten x better. So, you know, marketing was just ripe to be disrupted back then. Um, and we saw how, you know, the, the, the demand were, was growing up and more uh, funding went into this market. So I find myself very uh, good with uh, competitive landscape. I, I try to be with more companies out there educating the market and just because I know that also long term, it leads to a, a the better the better product and better go to market execution will win but i think that as a, as a product guy i believe that the product definitely delivers the long term and i can give you an example if uh, we looked at eloqua back then it was the giant marketo was trying to be a player um and then hubspot was the smallest kind of category so uh category player uh, over time eloqua got acquired by less than a billion marketo got acquired twice uh, and then end up being an adobe company for 4.7 billion and you can see HubSpot's valuation today. And I think HubSpot did a great job with a product-led go-to-market and a product offering. Um, so I think over time, continuing to, to invest there be, uh, led to them be the, the by far the biggest uh, player in the B2B marketing uh, from revenue perspective and number of customers. Uh, Aptrinsic to me um, is also a future uh, growth area because I saw that as being part of Marketo, 
uh, we had suddenly 6,000 customers and the, the way we tried to upsell and cross them was so inefficient. We tried to use the same email type of nurturing. And we also realized as any other customer, any other uh, company is acquiring new customers is going to be way more expensive than upsell and cross of existing install base. So at this point, how do you do it be better? And this is where I saw that the opportunity to lead with your product, understand the usage, correlated with revenue um, and really message to your customers as part of your uh, product experience to drive them towards value. We know that if you use customer success manually or, or do anything like uh, the old, the, the classic marketing way, you might not be able to address uh, the, the, the gold mine that you have as, as users. I focus more on disrupting a category than creating a category. And there's definitely signals, some you control, what, can you really build a, a technology that can give a 10X value? Second, what is the market actually right now? Is it a high priority? Because you don't control the market. Um, so if the market is not there and you have the most fantastic product, I think you'll, you'll not be successful at that, this time. And you can see it historically as well. Like many great companies just went down because the market was not ready yet. Oh my God, that's the one, maybe one of the biggest reasons for sure. So depending on the market status, depending on your product offering, you're saying, you know, consider it twice before you create a category, uh, maybe you disrupt one. One of the previous guests, um, Joe Cherno from, from Pendo mentioned, you know, when you're about to create a category, he said there is one question that you can ask yourself. If you're replacing a line item on the budget, then you're, you're an existing category. You might just prefer, provide a better product, better, better, better value. If there is no line item, maybe it's your it's a new category. So, uh, what do you think about that, James? What do you think about uh, Mickey's comment about disrupting versus creation, and <clears throat> about that that question you should ask yourself: whether you should even create a category to create a category to begin with? Yeah, I I think uh, well, I would recommend trying to be a disruptor versus creating a new category because it's a lot harder to get a company to basically create new budget for a new thing, right? Than it is to say, oh, and we're better than this other thing that you currently have. We just, we can get you a 10X return versus the two or three X that you're gonna get from that company. Those two sales are like completely different. And so, um, you know, I think on, for us, we, we, we did start a new category. I mean, the CDP category was new, nobody was buying it. You know, it's still relatively new in terms of like, and so I think that the market um, you know, just wasn't there. And, and, um, but I, I definitely think it's a lot harder to, to go down the path of building a new category. I think for us, some of the things that we did to try to, you know, hack our way around the, you know, creating a new category was get the product, um, into users' hands just so that they could try it and give us feedback. So I think one of the things you're, if you're, in a new category, even disrupting an existing category, the product-led approach is just, you have to have the ability to turn feedback around and continue to iterate on the product. And um, that's super important too, was uh, make sure you know who you you have a, if you're a disruptive product or um, if you're trying to create a new category, who is that user, right? If it's Pendo, it's a product manager. If it's us, right? It was sort of like, is it a marketer or is it somebody in IT or is it a developer? Um, and so I think you have to pick one user and really build your product for that user. And in marketing, it's confusing, right? Because you have IT people doing implementation, you have developers that are on the marketing team, you have analysts on the marketing team, you have, you know, campaign people, content people, uh, marketing operations. Um, and so I think like anytime you're trying to be disruptive or create a new category, who is that user? get the tool into their hands as quickly as you can and get as much feedback as you can. And I definitely think kind of the third piece there for us in terms of kind of hacking around was we did that. We basically, we had kind of freemium offering designed for marketers at kind of, you know, mid-market businesses. And then the third piece was, was we had partners. So in the marketing ecosystem, there are 9,000 companies. And so just having MailChimp say, you know, we were sort of a, like a, a, a tool that integrates a lot of different data sets. Um, and so we had MailChimp and Optimizely and a few of these other partners that basically put up landing pages um, that said, oh, if you want to have smarter segments, use Lytics. And they directed 
you know, directed them to our landing page. And so we didn't spend any money on ads. We just had basically these ecosystem partners um, push people in our direction. Uh, but, I, you know, I don't know. I, I definitely think like if you're trying to create a category or even disrupt a category, it's all about the product market fit. And so how do you get your product into people's hands and get feedback and know that that that's something that they'll use and that they'll get value from and that they love? I think that that's really the key. Sounds like back to basics. Both, both, both Mickey and you are very fundamental on just, yeah. you know, find the customer and delight them. Let's, I, I want to I go back to, and Mickey, you mentioned something about Eloqua. I, I actually had Mark Organ here and he was talking about it with Sorrow, how he worked so hard to create a category, succeeded, and then sold the company, and then someone else took over the category and did a much bigger job. And like you said, HubSpot is now continues. Uh, it's funny, not everyone agrees on HubSpot being a great product. I actually agree that they have a great product and they led with that, uh, but not all, the guests, not all the guests are on the same page. How, what happens when you, you, know, when you started uh, Uptrinsic or Inside Terra? I'm sure there are other, other companies uh, in there. And how do you... Do you think about that? Do you, do you, do you consider, or am I, am, am I going to create this category and then someone else is going to snatch it from me? Like, how do you think about that when you, when you build a company? And, you know, you had the particular experience of uh, joining larger enterprises right after. And so that's right. the unique perspective I'd love to hear. Yeah, I think it's eventually also when you, you, you do get into that market demand, which is growing, and the trick is to see it early stage. Uh, although you can always jump in. We saw Zoom jumping in uh, into a very mature category. We saw Monday.com jumping in, but that's actually more a product. Like you, they disrupted with uh, uh, a little bit better product, but also a very different go-to-market efficiency. Very high scale product led go-to-market who can really disrupt any big giant out there. Um, so that's what their play. In early stage, when you're really building a category like marketing automation was a, a forming category. Customer success is a forming category. Product experience management like Gains HPX and Pendo is a forming category, but you always, you always replace something in the line item. I don't agree that that's some, suddenly it's gonna be completely new. You might have, you're basically replacing something because it's not that they didn't do that so far. They, they did it very inefficiently. Uh, so I would say that in looking at that and looking at the execution is really, really key to, to nail down both the product understanding demand, but how do you really figure out the, the sales playbook, the repeatable model to that? That is something where a lot of founders uh, fall short. They always keep that you know, niche and they always describe their product as a super sophisticated intergalactic uh, buzzwords. And the end customer is like looking for a simple solution with 10X. And think about Tesla. Is Tesla creating category of EV? I think that they're disrupting the industry, the automotive category. They disrupt it. They don't create it, but they give you a 10x better experience, 10x better car, more efficient on fuel, and the experience is like self-driving. So that's the way I think to do it. It's like really um, the execution of your go-to market, um, and then also the execution of the product. And creating this learning cycle is key. And as for Marketo, it was the same challenge. By the way, I thought that. They figured it out. I joined Marketo. It was a very small company. Uh, we grew very fast, but then Marketo was the, the, the unicorn. And I saw it's the same challenge there. Actually, they, they figure out what's going to be the next. It's from quarter to quarter to figure out the next uh, phase. Um, and the key is that execution, the right leadership. People are really uh, have a massive uh, impact on your business, the culture that you create. Um, and then the way you s outsmart your competition, and it's that's where I think the long term uh, is where if you do it better in that execution, both on go to market and product, and you weave that interlock that together well, uh, you will end up very successful. But if you're just great on your product or just great in your go to market, uh, and I've seen both companies, fantastic go to market companies that just failed miserably, and then the opposite, amazing technology product that just didn't go anywhere because they didn't have that interlock concept that uh, it has to be uh, hand by hand. Uh, and it doesn't matter which size company you are, by the way, it's just like high, you know, large scale, small scale, you have to always do that. Thank you. James, any, any comments? Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, I mean, in our space, we were early in the space, kind of creating the category. And then what happened was a different type of tool came in and said they were that thing and then took the category away. So I think we, we had a slightly different experience where 
we were in a space, we had great fit. We were doing exactly what, you know, we were basically helping marketers kind of run better marketing campaigns with, with better data sets or segments. And, um, and we were basically always from the beginning using kind of machine learning to, to help identify those opportunities. But then a simpler model came in like with segment where it was like, oh no, we don't apply data science and we don't help you find like audiences, but we'll just take data from point A and we'll move it to point B. And then they were selling into developers and developers kind of came, came up from underneath the marketers and said, uh, don't worry about it. We have a way to solve this. Um, and it's a lot easier. We'll just grab data from here and, and we'll drop it into your, into your email marketing uh, tool. And so, and then, and then segment, you know, originally they would call themselves a tag manager and then they called themselves a customer data infrastructure tool. And then, you know, eventually they were like, oh, and we're a CDP too. And so we started getting into deals where the, it was like, we're an orange and they're an apple. And, you know, but their, their apple is really simple and the developers are recommending it. And so it became a pretty challenging, like the category kind of flipped and made it pretty challenging for us. The next turn of the category though, because these categories are not static, um, is that Adobe and Salesforce said, oh, we have CDPs. And actually these CDPs are for business users, for marketers. And when I you know, talked to the CEO uh, of Segment at one point, he was like, you know, the market is kind of changing and developers aren't making the buying decision for CDP anymore. It looks like marketers are. And suddenly now we're competing against you know, Salesforce and it's apples to apples and we can compete much more effectively. So we kind of seen this, this change in the category where um, the definition has changed. And at one point we had fit, then we didn't have fit because the, the category changed. And now we have fit again because it's like the, the buyer um, went from marketing to developer back to marketing. And um, so it's a fickle, it's a fickle thing. And I think Mickey makes a good point, which is you've got to continuously kind of update and navigate and think about your go-to-market and, you know, where do you fit in the category and how are you bringing value to, to customers? And you can't sort of continue to flip-flop back and forth. Like if we had just said, oh no, now we service, you know, developers, we would have missed kind of the point where we are today where marketers are like, no, we own this and this is the tool that we need. Um, yeah, I would say that uh, there's like a... Uh a statement about being resilient and being responsive to change will actually make this, you to survive. So the, the survival of the fittest is basically on that. You need to recognize if the buyer is changing, you need to re recognize you know, if there's gonna be a category uh, definition change and be flexible for that if it's the right thing. Uh, but as, as category to me, to, to, to your question, if we see more players and we see more players in, the product experience manager, we're seeing app queues and walk me's and, and walk me is not a new player, but app queues is a new player or intercom. It's always, to me, it's good news because now it's your time to go and execute on differentiation. It's very difficult to go and tell someone you need this. Why? Because this and sell all this high value. This is a very, a very long deal cycle, but I want to be the top three they look at and then say them exactly why they should choose uh, my solution. And so I think, and then also make sure that uh, I execute better on the go to market and there's place for everybody. What we saw with uh, marketing automation, you know, the, we thought, oh my God, now we have so many players in marketing automation doing email marketing to even same segment. But in the end, everybody were, was, was growing very dramatically and was great for the industry. It was fantastic that uh, Salesforce built that marketing cloud and Adobe built marketing cloud and I think eventually it, it brings, uh, I think, innovation. It brings growth, so many new startups, so much more value. So I'm a big believer that more players in is fantastic. And there's uh, many things think that one player takes all, but not in the subscription business and software. I feel like temporarily, yes, Eloqua was the big, uh, the, the 800 pound gorilla that takes all, but suddenly Marketo disrupted them with simplicity until Marketo became complex and but more sophisticated and then HubSpot came with simplicity and so forth. So it's, it's, it's a nice to see. And it's very healthy for our community, I would say, to create that uh, competition and create more opportunities to metadata and other players to go and optimize on top 
But if we didn't do that, I think there was no chance for 9,000 other startups to go in and build that. So being flexible and being in the fight on a daily basis is what we do. And we like tough challenges. So we're crazy enough to do that. And you need to make sure that your management is doing that. And I, I found Marketo management is these guys are in the battlefield, you know, uh, uh, unstoppable and also in gain side, the same management team, unstoppable, you know, know how to, you know, learn from mistakes, fix, go better in. Uh, so I think this is a core dimension in your go-to-market to make that culture of learning fast and executing and fixing. Uh, long-term, you're going to see results um, if the market is there. I mean, it's kind of funny. The Eloqua Marketo story, I think, is a good one. And I know like Joe Payne and I know John Miller. So I kind of know a little bit of both sides of that story. Um, Marketo would not exist if Eloqua had not kind of done a lot of the hard work, which was, yeah, build a tool, kind of a first version of a tool to take data and put it into an email campaign and automate that process. Like the pain in the ass part is getting marketers to adopt a new workflow and figure out actually how to do that. Like, I think anybody is kind of going through that right now that uses like AI and ML to replace some of the things that, that you might do manually and marketers or, or any business user is like, well, that's not how I do it. I mean, this is how we do marketing automation. And you're telling me we should do it a different way. And Eloqua solved a big part of that problem by having these agencies that came in and built practices around, we'll help you set up track one, track two, track three. Part of that, I think, helped them get into market, but it probably also meant that they didn't improve their tool. They let agencies basically do a lot of that work. And then Marketo came in and said, oh, we can automate a lot of this. We can make it easier. The user experience can be better. And so then you had to make a decision. Do I want the enterprise tool where I have to have an agency or I can just sign up with Marketo and it's a little bit cheaper, but it it, it just works out of the box better. And, um, and then the next iteration of that was obviously HubSpot <laughs> where they're like, it's way cheaper and way easier. Um, and so it, these cycles, I think, kind of, they, they tend to play themselves out in new categories. I and, think this is uh, the, the, the secret sauce, right? It's like, uh, you basically uh, speak about why, what led me to build Aptrinsic, for example, because actually I recognize the same pattern you just mentioned. The new player is going to have a better usability of their product to do better solutioning, and then they want to disrupt existing player. So product-led growth, which I you know, wrote a book about uh, more than three years ago, was like, this is actually the pattern, right? You're going to come with a better product to existing market and disrupt the bigger one. And that's the cycle. And I also saw that uh, if you look at the company's life cycle, five to 10 years and they go like, you know, they, they disappear suddenly. And, and even today, can there's IBMs and, and Oracle, these logos are not as powerful as before. Uh, there's like every every two three years you see the new players like Snowflake now is the hot company. Um, so there's a cycle of company and recognition, and I think that the product led growth or having that product play is the secret sauce. And my my passion is to help companies with the product led growth type of uh, motion because that's what helped disrupt and keep our economy going forward all the time. Well, I was going to say you've got to be able to unlock that scale. Um, I mean, you can look at so many different examples, like in the in the kind of the Siam space, right? Customer identity access management or whatever it is. Like early in that space, you had Gigya and you had Janrain and they were kind of battling it out. And they kind of, one got acquired by Akamai, the other one got acquired by SAP. And then Auth0, right? A way simpler developer tool just got acquired by Okta for $6.5 billion. And so product-led growth is basically what enables you to simplify the whole process from, you know, how I adopt and get a tool into my company. Um, and that allows you to basically scale the number of customers and the growth opportunity. It's just, it's just math. If I can get a hundred or 200,000 customers like Twilio, and even if they're not spending like enterprise dollars yet, I have an opportunity to continue to add SKUs and grow that. So I think, you know, early companies, they spend so much time trying to get the go to market right and the product fit right, that there's always this opportunity for a company to come underneath. Another example is in tag management, right? You had Tagman and Telium and you had, uh, there were, oh, uh, uh, Insighton. 
you know, these early tag managers that eventually just got, got replaced. And then segment came in and um, now there's rudder stack, which is an open source version of that more developer friendly. And I think um, the push is always, how do you, in, how do you make this easier frictionless for a customer? Um, and the product has got to be the piece that leads that the, the, the old enterprise model, it only works for like a handful of companies. Yeah. Maybe one, one kind of side note is just being outside of San Francisco, like in San Francisco, everybody's in the network. Like everybody works at startups. Everybody knows where they fit. They've kind of done a tour of duty or two. And it's, it's like the patterns get repeated in Portland. It's not the same, right? You're kind of, you're creating startup employees and you're creating your own kind of playbook and you're not in that network. And so, um, Lots of kind of painful learnings in, in, in that regard, I would it's say. It's cool, though. I'm, I'm excited to see. Uh, I agree that there are, there are new hubs being created, especially now after 2020. And I'm, I'm kind of excited about that to, to see talents from other, other areas. Miami, you know, I'm, I'm just here for the week, but I see, uh, I see quite a bit of, of techies and companies. And I was sitting down in, in, a, in a hookah bar and heard someone talking about evaluations and up into the right kind of conversation for like 45 minutes. And I was so confused uh, because I never heard that, never heard that before. In, uh, in Bend, Bend, Oregon, actually a cool place. And also have like suddenly a startup scene. So many like really cool places because being remote is now possible. Yeah. I think one of the biggest mistake is trying to hire only in one central location as mm -hmm. opposed to find talent. Now talent is global, way more you know, attractive market and you can find talent anywhere from Scandinavia to, you know, Middle East, you can really find a ton of talent. Uh, and, if, and it's just become more and more um, natural for, for teams to work and collaborate with across uh, cultures as well. I think that's like, you know, don't try to hire. We were trying to hire always in Silicon Valley as Marketo. It took us a ton of time and people are just have different expectation, different cost of living. Mm -hmm. um, so if you're an early stage startup, just do that, you know, global arbitrage. Uh, yeah, you know that you're going to do a lot of mistakes. One of the biggest mistakes is not to take decisions. Uh, and but you have to take fast decision, not necessarily based on a lot of data. So you're bound to have mistakes. The, the trick is to fix them. If you stick with a mistake and convince yourself it's going to get better, then it's mistake. But you're going to do mistakes. Oh, I love it. No, bad, bad hiring, but just change it or bad. This is that. Fix them. Make those mistakes and fix them. I like that. Cheers. Exactly. B bad, bad product decision. Fix it. It's just like, but don't, don't stick around and be saying no. The market will understand my my product is better. No, it's you. You did a mistake. Just fix it. Nice. I like we, that. Just recently, we that is a, just a pet peeve of mine, which is like not making a decision, right? I mean, it's like let's make a decision, wrong decision, right decision. Let's make a decision. And uh, not making a decision is making a decision, like like you said. Yeah, Amazon has this concept where it's like, you know, one way door, two way door, where it's like one way door decision is like you can only go in and you're, you're kind of stuck. And those are maybe decisions. There are very few of those, but those are ones you should ponder for a little bit. Mm -hmm. Two way door decision is like you can go in and then you can you can fix it. No problem. And I'm always like, is this a two way door decision? Like, let's just make the decision and go. I having a, a mechanism that just gives people permission to make a decision, even if it's the wrong one with limited data. It makes all uh, velocity is the key in any startup, just being able to move fast. That's our advantage. And if you take that away by laboring over like decisions, you, you're going to fail. That's, that's a good segue. So, you know, Mickey started, you continued with, with the decision making and how that is for an entrepreneur. You must make mistakes. Not making a decision is the bad decision, the worst decision in the world. Uh, what, what truth do you have as entrepreneur? Jimmy, you can start. As, as serial entrepreneurs, what are the absolute truths or bullshits that you are aware of that seem to be common somehow and, you know, like almost idioms or cliches, you know, things that you see on Saster or things you read about on LinkedIn, on Forbes over and over that you know is bullshit. You know, from your experience, it's not true at all. Um, do you have like something that you, you, you keep seeing and you're thinking, this is not the experience I had. In fact, maybe even 180 degrees of that. Well, every company is a little bit different, but, but um, you know, I think one, one thing that does happen is as soon as you get investors, they have their own kind of mental model for what your organizational structure should be. And so I think that's bullshit. Like there's no kind of, oh, you now, now you're at this size, you need a VP of sales and you need this and you need that. And it's like, 
depending on your go-to-market model and your product and everything is so different. So I, I think there isn't like a one size fits all, like, oh, now you need to go hire your head of marketing and companies that do that without kind of understanding what they really need. Um, so that's, those are mistakes. Um, I'm wondering if, we were, if you're referring to uh, Jason Lemkin's uh, push for VPs the moment you raise the Series A. I, I, can, I think I hear some of that in there. Yeah, I, I, I think like, yeah, VP f- for what reason, right? I mean, do you have a team of 30 people or 20 people or 10 people? Maybe, okay, maybe there are reasons for it. But I think it just as a rule of thumb, like these, these kind of rule of thumbs, that doesn't, I think you got to look at what you need and what type of organization you are and who you're selling to. And, uh, you know, if you're selling to developers, right, you don't need a VP of marketing. You don't need a VP of sales. Those, those are not things that you need. So I, I think just thinking that through. Um, the second one is like, I actually think like fundraising. I love the idea that we can be dispersed. I also think that we can be product led. And if you put those two things together, it could mean that you don't have to go raise money. So in, in some future life, um, and there are companies that are very successful that don't raise, you know, venture capital. Um, but I think the flip side of that is a truism is you have to have velocity. It's pretty hard to kind of, you know, really build a startup and get people excited and create, create momentum and, and maintain momentum without like moving fast. So if you need kind of fun funds to do that. Um, but I think that may be that, we, we may not, I mean, I've raised money before, so obviously, but I do know of companies today that are basically, they're product led, they're really small, they're really lean and they're crushing it. And they've got 20, 30, 40 million in ARR and they're like 10, 15 people. Like that's not impossible and they've never raised money. So these, these different business models um, are, are out there. I think we, we're going to get locked into like one way of thinking. Mm-hmm. Just one pattern. Thank you. Mickey, do you have any do you have any any of those hidden truths or, or absolute uh, truths you've experienced as an entrepreneur that that they are not maybe common or even the opposite narrative is is the public one? Yeah, I think success. I think PR that you read uh, is is the biggest BS you read. It's basically every company is doing so great, squeezing oranges. It's like they're doubling and doubling and doubling. And in Marketo, we actually did good. We did double, but it was so hard. We did so many mistakes. People think that, oh, they figured it out, they had a system, they followed that, boom, 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 and then, you know, putting the ducks in the road. That's like not what happened. It was very difficult. It's difficult when you're five people and you, when you're 5,000 people. It's difficult. They have different challenges. Um, and it's like what you see in PR, oh, they figure out the space. Oh, this is the, they grew, they went IPO, got acquired. It's all like, you know, very repeatable. I think it's just reality. Every company at any stage has challenges uh, and, and it's about the people that are fixing those challenges and, and just PR describe a very romantic way uh, to draw, but it draws in more new entrepreneurs that think it's going to be, hey, I'm going to be. <laughs> the dis- disillusionment. <laughs> yeah, let's try that. I had like a, a neighbor that says like, you know, he, he feel like he was senior enough to start. Uh, and the first thing I told him like, you know, you're going to get hit hard if you really want to be uh, someone that goes after that you, you need to really be prepared for that because he felt very seasoned already you know he was a VP for many many years um, so you know it is first obviously you can imagine his first year and with his experience right now is like he realizes that it's not that romantic path you have to be committed and you have to be you know work very hard and I can tell you that if I look at the uh, Nick Meta from Gainsight, you know, he looks always super energetic and he is an amazing person, but he works very, very, very hard. It's, it's not like squeezing oranges. <laughs> uh, thank you for that. Both of you are entrepreneurs. So there's a lot to learn from you outside of uh, category and marketing and, and positioning. Maybe you can share a, a moment in your career. You know, Mickey, I met you the first time, I think, in a, in a Bessemer Ventures or a Lightspeed. I think it was a Lightspeed event uh, for, for marketers. Since, th- since that time, it's been, uh, you know, a minute. Tell us uh, of a, a big hashtag failed moment you had as an entrepreneur. A moment that was, you know, tough. You thought you fucked it up. All this, you know, all this, all these years and and, and tears and and sweat. Like, do you do you have uh, something already popping on your mind? A ton of these moments. 
<laughs> I think that the early stage, so first timers go through a lot more to prove and get funding. The first timers, you, you don't have the, uh, the pedigree that they are looking for. And for me, as someone that grew up in Israel, Tel Aviv, coming to Silicon Valley, nobody knows you. And obviously, they're scared to, to put any, any investment. So I think, you know, for me to learn uh, the VC route, what they expect to see, what are the signals was uh, a lot of try and error. Uh, I definitely could have uh, spent time with just mentoring, getting in touch with, with entrepreneurs. Um, you know, that's I think it's they can push you like, you know, two, three years forward just for, for these basic insights. So today I'm doing those for several companies, you know, just early stage, giving them some direction towards like, hey, just, you know, that's what you expect to do, go and do. So I did do a lot of mistakes with early stage. Uh, and I remember like crazy painful moments that uh, one of the VCs told me like, yes, we're going to sign and invest. And we went celebrating Thursday night. Uh, and during that celebration, I got text from the investor saying, no, we decided not to. And was, I was supposed to sign a term sheet on Friday morning. Uh, and it was like, it just, you know, these things you need to bounce back and the team is with you just doing the cheers. Mm -hmm. Literally you, you get this call and you go outside, you come back and like the party is basically over. Then that night, um, you know, we, we actually, uh, reached out to other VCs and to keep it short, like we actually found a, a different VC that actually said, yes, come tomorrow, Friday noon let's sign the term sheet because uh, we already had one in the bag and the second investor just like got cold feet and we said great next thing that happened we are in san francisco we we kind of where was in the hotel I, I gave the car to that uh in the in the valet parking and i was calling the car and, and nobody shows up apparently we forgot to fuel the car and the car was stuck <laughs> <laughs> so we got late to that uh, uh, other meeting. Uh, I think it was like one hour late, but eventually it's a, there's a good ending. Uh, but what is the story as a bad ending? Uh, like, you know, that you're, you're basically a mess up and the key is to, you know, come back again and, and make sure that you learn from that. Um, don't try to say, oh, they are wrong. Maybe they are wrong, but you lost the game. Uh, and I think it's key. And I did a lot of mistakes about positioning. I think a lot of mistake about, you know, how to, especially around the go-to-market in terms of like, uh, you know, when you're building a company, think about the packaging, the pricing, keep it simple, analyze the market, spend time with customers, spend less time on your uh, decks all the time. Back to fundamentals. <laughs> oh my God. You know, I see so many, like uh, spend so much time on presentation and, and board decks and it's like, drive zero value to your cost to, to your company in the end and if you spend time acquiring you new use new customers in and learning their challenges and evolving with your product team then you're really getting somewhere as opposed to building more and more internal decks and, and meetings and all that stuff so Enough. That, that's like something i would definitely uh recommend as well james tell us about your your hashtag fail moment you, you got some time yeah. to, to think about your top kind of like you know, there's the, there's the 10,000 hours and maybe every entrepreneur has like 10,000 mistakes. I don't know. Um, which one do I pick from? I mean, I have a, bu a bunch around fundraising. I have a similar story to Mickey's where uh, my co-founder and I, we had one meeting on one side of town kind of near the Embarcadero and we, we rented a car and we parked uh, kind of along the Embarcadero. And then we went into the meeting and we came out and um, I was pretty excited because I'm like the next meeting, I'm pretty sure they're like, they said, this is kind of, you know, we're, we're going to do our, um, you know, like the uh, kind of the full pitch to the partners and everything and really excited. But I was like, well, we'll squeeze one meeting in before that. We came out, car's gone, you know, it had been towed. And I'm like, oh, crap, how are we going to get to the other side of town? I was like, he, my, my co-founder was like, well, let's call, you know, let's see if we can get a taxi or whatever. I just started running. So I ran basically, got to Market Street, ran up, I was sweating. Got in, did the pitch. I looked around and there was like, there was two guys that were sleeping um, and uh, the pitch was horrible. I mean, it just, of course I was completely discombobulated and the guy like basically stopped me. He goes, look, I don't, I don't feel like you're really ready for this. And I'm like, I'm really sorry. You know, my car got towed, blah, blah, blah. They're like, well, why don't you come back next week and, and we'll try this again. Um, and we did. And, and ultimately they, 
they did fund us, which was great. But um, and then I had to after that, of course, the you know I had to go and find my car, and it was like four hundred dollars to get it out of the impound. Oh, you uh, got cheap. That usually it's, it's double the price in San Francisco. Yeah, no, <laughs> this was a while ago. Um, so that was kind of a disaster. I think, I mean, tons of mistakes with teams and hiring. It's really hard to kind of when you're early stage to find people that fit. Like, I think you always make the mistake, or at least I made the mistake of thinking that somebody had like you know, good experience at a different company that, that is something that you would may, to, may aspire to be would be a good fit for a startup. Not always the case, right? Uh, there's a different type of person that, that fits into a startup, you know, 10 person size company, 50 person size company. And so that those are painful learnings that, that are also kind of expensive because, you know, somebody who is an expert and brings in a playbook, and, and tries to apply it to your business. And you're like, that's, that's not what we're doing. We're actually, we're trying to do something else, um, but has a lot of credibility and experience. Those, those types of conflicts can be pretty, pretty painful. We, we rented a place uh, here in Portland in Old Town. Um, and I was, we were, my co-founder and I, of course, were pretty, we're cheap and, you know, let's get the, the, the cheapest place we can find. But the place that we had was basically if you walk downstairs and went out the back door, there were always junkies right out the, the door, out the front door. There was like a, a homeless encampment. And so, you know, we were trying to recruit uh, different types of people to come join the company. And that was a little bit of a turnoff. That was a mistake. Uh, <laughs> I know. can actually emphasize with this one. We had the unsafe, yeah, unsafe place. Unsafe place. Is that in San Francisco? No, this was in Portland. Oh, this is in Portland. In San Francisco, we had uh, one of our employees, one of the new employees, ask one of the current employees, like, oh, I noticed that you're wearing boots. Is it going to be a, a rainy day in San Francisco? She said, no, it's just always there's human feces in the front door, so I always have to walk around with boots. <laughs> That's a San Francisco comment. Yeah. You know, we our audience is, are, are mostly CEOs and founders, early stage, uh, and then some some more seasoned CMOs and VPs of marketing who are looking at category creation. Do you have a piece of advice for for them as the, you know, other than the fundamental that you mentioned, of course, focus on customers, focus on product led, etc. Do you have do you have a, a the one piece of advice that you think is the you know is the most fundamental uh, for someone who just went through that experience and can they see they see the light, but they they also have a lot more to go through, like you said. I think early stage is about also like, do you have enough conviction that you saw that? So number one, are you from that space or you're just trying to kind of really uh, be successful financially? If you're trying to be successful financially and this is the reason you're driving a startup, you're going, I think you're going to fail. I think it's like about your passion about solving and you really are coming from that 10,000 hours or whatnot. You saw this problem, you grew, you, this is what will actually go get you through these ups and downs because you have some basic fundamental truth. If you don't have that and you're trying that just as to be cool and try to kind of uh, do some quick uh, uh, turnaround and, and exit, it's not going to be successful. And so if I hear an entrepreneur saying, I have a great idea and I work on it for a year, but I'm not from the space specifically, and he already mentions that uh, exit uh, strategy, to me, this guy will fail. Because if you think about exit before even starting and you're not from really deep in that space, most chances in the first couple of bumps, uh, you, you're going to you know, be out of the game. Okay. Okay, that's that's advice. That's that's advice. Maybe don't start if that's you know ask yourself those questions. And if that's the case, maybe uh, take a step back and re reconsider. James, what do you? What's your one? Uh, For somebody who advice? just gotten their Series A funding, CEO. Yeah. Mm. You know, when you go and you raise your Series A, especially if you're a first-time entrepreneur, you know, you you're, you're creating a narrative, a story out of a very small data set. Right? You're like, oh, I've got five customers or I've got 20 customers and here's the things that they're doing. And if we extrapolate that out, like here's what we can do. And you, you're kind of telling a, you're telling a very interesting story um, with, with not a lot of kind of data underneath it. And so, and then you raise money and that's validation that this story is correct. And this plan that you've been presenting is, is true and, and will be delivered upon. <laughs> Uh, kind of whole cloth. And I think like the, the opportunity um, may, may be that, that kind of whoo, hockey stick inflection where we we're going to go from five to 5,000. But I think it's a good opportunity to kind of take a step back and say, 
hey, I did a really nice job fundraising. I created a very compelling story that created urgency with the with the and you know kind of opportunity to 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 get on board. I believe in the company and the product and the vision that I have, but maybe I need to take a step back and and, and as I start to think about how we're going to spend this money, have a have the a, have a second viewing of what that plan should be because I think a lot of first time I got my series A you believe that whole story and you just go spend and then you're suddenly it's like whoa I now I got a now it's series B and sometimes it works but a lot of times it doesn't and so you know the investors are incentivized to get you to spend that money and see if it works or not um, you may just take a step back and take a breath take a beat and kind of think hmm you know, maybe, maybe my plan, yeah, we're going to get to 5,000 customers, but maybe we'll get to 500 customers and it'll look like this. And Wonderful. Hey, I wrote a lot during this, uh, this episode. Thank you. There's a lot of uh, hidden gems that you gave our audience. So I thank you for that. Thank you very much for both of your wisdom and sharing that with us as well as the funny moments. Um, this is the end of the podcast. I really appreciate your participation. And uh, to our listeners out there, have a wonderful rest of the day. And to you, have a wonderful weekend. Thank you, Mickey. Thank Thank you, you, James. Thanks again for joining us. I hope that you enjoyed today's discussion and will tune in again. Find all of the B2B Category Creators episodes at metadata.io. And if you have any feedback, topics, or would like to be a guest on the show, please reach out.